I think we'll go ahead and get started if everybody's ready. Um, I want to thank you all for being here and attending the January Fairbanks Ethics Lecture. My name is Brian Leland. I'm faculty over at the Fairbanks Center for Medical Ethics and Associate Program Director of our Clinical Ethics Fellowship. And I have the distinct pleasure of introducing Emily Munson, who I'm just now realizing I went all the way through grade school with. Um, so this lecture is actually being broadcast at Ball and Blackford and Arnett and North and West, so we appreciate everyone who is streaming in live. I will take this opportunity to ask you to please silence your cell phones and put your pagers on vibrate, and if you need to answer your phone, I will kindly ask that you step out. And there is a bank of phones in a closet just across, across the hallway. So Emily is an Indianapolis attorney and she has a passion for disability rights and health law. She leads the Indiana Disability Rights Employment Practice Group, and she oversees both litigation and systemic advocacy projects. Prior to doing that, she was attorney and administrative law judge for Indiana's Family and Social Services Administration. She graduated from Indiana University School of Law in 2010 and has since also earned a master's in philosophy and will soon complete a degree in health law policy and bioethics as well. Uh, the short and quick is she's a rock star and her dossier is much too lengthy for me to continue reading through without uh, negatively impacting her opportunity to share with you today on our topic of rethinking informed consent after traumatic spinal cord injury. So please join me welcoming Emily. Thank you, Brian. Um, we can go ahead and go to the next slide. So, time, so. <laughs> um, today's objectives will be to recognize and identify what's known as the disability paradox in disability rights literature, um, to talk a little bit about the bias against disability that we see not only in the medical, but also the legal communities, um, to consider informed consent and autonomy immediately following traumatic disabling injury. Um, I've chosen for the presentation to focus on spinal cord injury because I think it's most accessible to lay people without medical backgrounds. Um, and as a person with a mobility disability, it's also more accessible to me. Um, and finally, uh, to introduce a couple of ideas to go about obtaining informed consent um, for the withdrawal of treatment for newly diagnosed patients that have spinal cord injury should withdrawal of treatment be their express preference. Um, next slide, please. Before we get into that, um, I wanted to say thank you so much for inviting me to come and speak. Um, I interned at the Fairbank Center in law school and grad school um, from June through November 2008. Um, and yeah, Brian told you about my professional background, but um, so you see where I'm coming from as it pertains to disability. I'd like to tell you a little bit about my personal background. Um, when I started at the Fairbank Center, uh, Patty Bledsoe told me, no one gets into bioethics without an ax to grind. And certainly that was true in my case. Um, I have spinal muscular atrophy, which is a degenerative neuromuscular disorder. Um, and when I was a kid, I spent quite a bit of time in this hospital, um, and the reason I actually got into bioethics when I was little is because I, I suffered a great deal here um, and, and felt like as a kid I did not have autonomy. Um, just to provide an example, um, two days after my ninth birthday, I had scoliosis surgery. Um, and the doctors and my parents decided that even as I was recuperating, 
I should still get physical therapy so that I didn't lose any range of motion. Um, even though I was on post-surgical narcotics, I was still screaming and crying about how bad the PT hurt, um, even you know, just hours before I got discharged. And uh, when I got home, my ankles were black and blue, and the PT had uh, broken the Achilles tendons in both ankles and um, broken some of the small bones in my feet. So I, I had an axe to grind, and I was all about patient autonomy. And then when I was in Washington, D.C., uh, in college, I had the opportunity to do an internship at the National Council on Disability. When it was there that I, I came to learn more about um, the disability rights movement and recognized the contributions made by people like Harriet McBride Johnson um, against Peter Singer that were not always uh, pushing for autonomy but had a more nuanced view. So uh, in, in my presentation, it probably will sound like I am anti-patient autonomy, um, but I, I, I think my view is probably a bit more nuanced than that, although I realize that patient autonomy is not um, the, the end-all, be-all. I, I do sympathize with people um, who have disabilities and feel that they are suffering. So next slide, please. Um, some of you might recall the case of Timothy Bowers. In 2013, Mr. Bowers fell from a tree. He was in Indiana, um, and he had a high-level spinal cord injury, was a quadriplegic. Um, within hours of getting to the hospital, Mr. Bowers was uh, awakened from his drug-induced coma and asked whether he wanted to live, um, knowing that he would be on a respirator um, or a vent. And he said no. And within less than 24 hours from the time he was injured, um, treatment was withdrawn, and Mr. Bowers passed away. Next slide, please. <laughs> um, this case gained a lot of national attention, even though it happened in Indiana. Um, one example of a story that was put out by NBC News talked about how Mr. Bauer's body was irreparably broken. Um, God forbid he, he rely on a machine to get through life. Um, but at the same time, all of the ethicists and uh, physicians that were interviewed tended to suggest, at least in the mainstream media, um, that you know uh, there is a right to withdraw treatment, and what happened when Mr. Bowers was standard medical practice. Um, in the comments made by Mr. Bowers' wife, um, she, she made sure that she let him know Never as a disabled person would he be able to give hugs or to hold his young child. Um, she projected that his quality of life would have been horrible and life expectancy very low. Um, so that is how kind of the mainstream covered Mr. Bauer's situation. Um, if you dug really deep, next slide please, you could find the disability community actively speaking out against what happened. Um, John Kelly, who is a spinal cord injury survivor at the same level of injury that Mr. Bowers had, had a lot of concerns um, with the way uh, consent to withdraw treatment was obtained, including the fact that he was um, intubated at the time, and that suggests maybe communication would have been impaired, um, and you know, at, at, le at the very least, the communication couldn't have been very nuanced. 
And as uh, I said, Mr. Bowers was awakened immediately from a, a, a coma and hit with all of this information. Um, in an ICU environment where we know uh, the, the environment is not very pleasant, um, th there are also incidences of uh, intensive care psychosis. Um, so, yeah, I, I, the disability community was, was very upset about um, both the speed and the way that Mr. Bowers consent was obtained. So um, what I've been interested in doing is looking at the larger um, system of obtaining informed consent after an individual is newly diagnosed with a spinal cord injury. Next slide, please. Um, when we look at the way people view t disability, there are two paradigmatic uh, models. One is the medical model, um, and that was the standard up until the disability rights movement uh, took hold and let's say the 70s. And the medical model says that people with disabilities um, are deviant from species typical functioning. And it is the responsibility of the medical community to get that disabled person treated or cured such that the disability can no longer be a barrier. Um, in other words, it, it essentially views the disability and the person with a disability as <clears throat> a problem uh, to themselves and to society. And the social model, which objects to the medical model, says no, um, human variance is natural. Um, genetic mutation, for example, is completely natural. And the real problem is the barriers that society erects that um, prevent people with disabilities from functioning in the greater community. So um, let's say someone has a spinal cord injury that necessitates the use of a wheelchair. Um, they can go to work. They can live independently. They just need uh, architect not to build uh, houses and workplaces with stairs. So the social model views disability as natural and um, kind of uh, if any barriers are in existence, they are the fault of society rather than the person with a disability. Uh, hold on real quick, I'm gonna take a drink. We could go to the next slide, please. Um, so, two um, professors, Gary Albrecht and Patrick Debliger, did a study um, about the medical model and attitudes toward people with disabilities. And they found a decided negative bias in the attitudes and expectations both of the public at large and of healthcare workers. And this was true even of healthcare <coughs> workers that interacted regularly with people with disabilities, um, like rehab workers. And other studies um, showed that people with disabilities had significantly more positive attitudes toward people with disabilities than nurses or members of the nursing faculty. So um, in subsequent studies, this was conducted in uh, 1999, have shown that even though it, it is not um, a conscious bias or, or discrimination, um, there is some inherent, um, an inherent function among the medical community to underestimate the value of lives of people with disabilities. 
Um, and that is what is known as the disability paradox. So lest you think that um, I am damning the medical profession, it exists in my profession too, the legal profession. Next slide, please. Um, the, the classic disability rights and discrimination case is that of Elizabeth Bouvier. Um, Ms. Bouvier had cerebral palsy and she went into a hospital one day and requested that they remove her nasogastric tube because she wanted to um, dehydrate and starve herself to death. Um, the court uh, had some really nasty language and I will quote its opinion. She is physically helpless and wholly unable to care for herself. She is totally dependent on others for all of her needs. These include feeding, washing, cleaning, toileting, turning, and helping her with elimination and other bodily functions. She cannot stand or sit upright in bed or in a wheelchair. She lies flat in the bed and must do so for the rest of her life. She suffers from degenerative and severely crippling arthritis. She is in continual pain. And the court went so far as to literally consider her existence meaningless. Um, and the, what the court did not do was say that immediately before she went to the hospital, um, or not, not immediately, but very uh, proximately to her going to the hospital and seeking death, um, she suffered a miscarriage. Her husband left her. She was evicted from her home. She was in a graduate program and a professor told her that because she had a disability, she would never get a job and she didn't belong. Um, so uh, also uh, her parents uh, had divorced years earlier and her mother had put her in an institution and rarely visited her. So Ms. Bouvier had a really, uh, some really shitty experiences. But when things were going well, um, back when she was with the, with the family and was pregnant and was pursuing education, she was happy. It was only these societal circumstances, um, personal circumstances, rather than the physical ones that caused her distress. Um, I think it would be reasonable to suggest that Ms. Bubio is probably suffering from depression, but the court didn't care about that um, and it gave her the order um, for the hospital to withdraw the NG tube. Um, it is worth noting that after she got the order, she did not um, choose to pursue that path. Um, in time, she decided to go ahead and keep living. Um, next slide, please. Um, the paradigmatic disability case um, involving spinal cord injury is the Larry McAfee case. Um, Mr. McAfee was a mechanical engineer in his 30s and he was paralyzed after a motorcycle accident. He sought a court order to get his vent removed um, and he also saw immunity for those assisting him um, from being criminally prosecuted. So because Mr. McAfee was an engineer, he developed a switch that he could operate that would turn his vent off. Um, and he had tried to commit suicide, but the uh, dyspnea was too much. He freaked out and uh, turned it back on. So he sought from um, the medical, his medical practitioners to have uh, pain meds so as not to suffer. Next slide, please. But again, uh, like Ms. Bouvier, we see factors beyond the disability that are influencing his decisions. In fact, one doctor called uh, Mr. McAfee the Willie Loman of the disabled and said uh, basically everything that could go wrong with the system did go wrong for Mr. McAfee. Um, after his injury, 
insurance picked up um, quite a bit of his care. It paid for rehab and uh, some home-based nursing, but pretty quickly he hit the million dollar insurance cap and spent down his assets very quickly and had to go on Georgia Medicaid. Um, at the time, Georgia was one of the um, most, uh, or I guess one of the least receptive states to home and community-based placement for people with disabilities. And so uh, Mr. McAfee was told he would have to live in a nursing home. Um, but no nursing home in Georgia would accept vent-dependent patients. What did Georgia do? They shipped McAfee to Ohio, where he had no friends, family, or any other form of support, and stuck him in a nursing home there. Um, after 14 months, Ohio decided that Georgia wasn't paying enough, so they shipped McAfee back to Georgia. Um, but again, there were no vent uh, capable nursing homes. So McAfee was living in an ICU room at Grady Memorial Hospital. Um, it was there that he sought the court order to um, have his life-sustaining treatment withdrawn. Um, and it was there that he had no TV or other opportunities for stimulation. Um, again, the disability rights uh, community questioned whether maybe um, intensive care psychosis was at play. It, certainly during some of the time that Mr. McAfee was residing um, in an ICU room. Next slide, please. And um, the Attorney General was representing uh, Georgia's interest in uh, preserving Mr. McAfee's life. But uh, the Attorney General conceded that Mr. McAfee was so disabled that um, Georgia really didn't want to push for his continued existence, that it would just see the case that uh, Mr. McAfee's right to refuse medical treatment outweighed any parent's patriae right that the state may have. The court um, also, in, in an unusual move, went so far as to uh, weigh in on issues that were not even presented at trial, um, including uh, uh, the judge issued a recommendation to Georgia's legislature to go ahead and amend its Living Will Act so that people would not end up like Mr. McAfee in the first place, um, that those who, who did not want to live life with a significant disability could go ahead and do advanced directives um, and not be treated at all. Um, and again, like in the Bouvier case, we see a complete um, failure to address any of those social barriers that made Mr. McAfee miserable. And again, it's worth noting that even though the court ordered um, for um, the, the hospital to follow McAfee's choice of having the vent withdrawn and pain meds. He hooked up with a um, rehab uh, and assistive technology professional in Alabama who um, taught McAfee how to work again with his functional limitations. And once Mr. McAfee uh, was hooked up with resources to learn and to live independently, he decided that he would go ahead living. Um, and uh, Mr. McAfee has since passed away of pneumonia, um, but chose ultimately not to have treatment withdrawn. Next slide, please. So you might ask, what about patients themselves? Aren't they the ones who should be making these decisions, not the court? and uh, not their physicians. Next slide, please. Well, um, like the courts and like the medical community, um, their society does have some degree of 
unwitting internal ableism. And um, I think there are a couple of economic theories that are worth considering. Um, the first is that people automatically associate positive characteristics with those groups that they associate with and um, associate negative characteristics with those groups that they don't or out groups. And um, most people um, don't have family members or friendships with people with disabilities. And so it's been shown that um, those people without disability experience tend to project really negative characteristics and stereotypes on people with disabilities, leading to fear of living as a person with a disability. Um, there's another economic theory known as focalism, and that suggests that when people are thinking about decision making in the future, um, they focus on a single issue rather than considering what their future holistically will be like. So when someone is thinking uh, about um, life with a disability, they probably are going to focus on all the negatives of disability and perhaps their physical situation rather than uh, supports from family or governmental support um, or you know, their career and other things that make life really satisfying. Um, and indeed, um, multiple studies have shown that people do um, have adaptive preferences. So when people are traumatically disabled, um, initially they are sad, go through depression, maybe even reevaluate their priorities. But once that's done, their levels of happiness equalize. Um, they find things that they can do that make them just as happy. And um, happiness is, does return to levels as were consistent prior, traumatic, prior to traumatic injury. Um, but we know that individuals have the right to um, make their own decisions. Um, next slide, please. Perhaps. Uh, okay, yeah, next slide. Okay. So, um, oh, wait, we can go back one. Uh, huh. Let's go for Let's go back, back. back uh, okay. Next. Next. Okay. Skipped one. So, uh, in, in addition to the, um, those theories, we also know that there are medical factors that affect decision-making of um, patients with recent spinal cord injuries. Those include um, the, those produced by the ICU environment, impaired communication, perhaps due to intubation, um, temporary psychiatric complications, hypoxemia, um, even simple decision-making can be affected by electrolyte and metabolic imbalances. Um, and then increasingly, there is some belief that um, some people with spinal cord injuries have head injuries or even traumatic brain injury that can affect complex decision making. So we have that coupled with, next slide, the uh, economic theories and ableism that we talked about. Um, next slide, how do we safeguard that? And we know that um, often informed consent is looked at as a safeguard uh, for protecting patients. And yep, the, um, the, the court case that kind of uh, studied that was Schlondorf versus Society of New York Hospital Gesundheit, um, in which every human being of adult years and sound mind has a right to to determine what shall be done with his own mind and body. Um, that's one of Justice Cardozo's uh, 
most um, famous quotations in all of jurisprudence. Um, and over time, that was extended by the Supreme Court. Next slide, please. Um, in the aftermath of abortion cases, like Griswold versus Connecticut, which um, talked about a, the Constitution having a privacy interest in the number of rights, the court in Quinlan extended that language and found um, that part of that right to privacy is the right to request um, that treatment be withdrawn. And then in Cruzan, the court ruled, uh, well, that um, again, the, the logical corollary of the, uh, those cases was to extend the informed consent doctrine um, to those cases where treatment is being requested to be withdrawn rather than given. So next slide. The question then is um, if we know that physicians who are giving patients information to help them make decisions might have some institutional bias against people with disabilities. And we know that the patient might have some of his or her own ableist uh, leanings and maybe some medical factors that complicate decision making. How do we get to understanding in that place where the newly disabled patient can truly exercise fully informed consent um, to either receive or withdraw treatment. And I suggest um, two different ideas. Next slide, please. The first would be the imposition of a waiting period prior to carrying out the withdrawal of life-sustaining treatment after an individual suffers um, a, a traumatic disability. And again, um, this presentation is limited to spinal cord injury because that, that's pretty straightforward and accessible um, rather than some other complicated medical issues. Um, we know that because the state does have um, parents' patriae authority to protect the lives of its citizens, um, that there is precedent for making people wait before their decisions or wants are carried out. Um, examples would be 72-hour psychiatric holds when an individual is posing a threat to themselves um, and also in those states that have um, physician-assisted suicide, there is a waiting period, um, 17, 15 days, from the time the patient expresses a desire to get lethal drugs before the prescription for them can be fulfilled. Next slide, please. So um, is, is that the answer? Does Time heal all wounds, not to be cliche. Um, well, we know that time might clear up some of those medical factors that put doubt on the clarity of one's ability to make decisions like deoxygenation and other um, physiologic responses. Um, we also know that patients um, who are newly disabled talk about being in a liminal state where their identity um, almost disappears and needs to be recreated. And um, a lot of studies have shown usually that time frame is about three weeks. So, um, you know, whether a, a statute would impose something. Um, mindful of that three-week period to come to grips with a new identity is um, something worth considering. And then um, some in the disability community, like 
uh, not dead yet, have um, proposed going so far as extending um, a, a waiting period until the individual has the opportunity to go through rehab where they'll learn about things they probably never knew existed, um, adaptive technologies that can help them drive again and perform other activities of daily living, um, to, to talk with others who are in similar situations, and just to get a different perspective. Um, next slide, please. My second um, proposal that I suggest considering is mandatory consultation with a similarly situated disabled individual before um, treatment could be withdrawn. Well, again, uh, even though it seems weird that a third party might intrude on the doctor-patient uh, relationship, there is precedent for this. Um, post uh, Casey, abortion law no longer distinguishes between mandatory disclosure statutes intended to inform choice versus um, those consultations that are created to influence choice. So even if one is concerned that the individual with a disability would maybe try to talk the patient into giving disabled life a chance, um, there's precedent for that being permitted. And then I, I believe four states um, currently have mandatory disclosure requirements regarding end-of-life treatment. Um, those would include options for um, aggressive treatment or palliative care, or um, if the state has um, physician-assisted suicide. And these mandatory disclosure consultation scenarios um, are justified um, according to court for a couple reasons. One is because neither in the abortion nor the end of life context is there really a traditional doctor physician or doctor patient relationship. I would argue that's the same in the aftermath of a traumatic injury. Um, likely the patient is dealing with new doctors, specialists who have not followed the patient for years and come to know the patient's um, preferences. There are minimal opportunities for the patient to receive counseling. Otherwise, certainly, if you are a couple days post spinal cord injury, um, you're not going to go down the street to uh, whatever kind of counseling. Um, and abortion and end of life are difficult and stress inducing circumstances. So too, or is becoming disabled. Um, and then the, the consultation would also um, give patients information that they might not otherwise seek. Um, I, I, uh, I think that someone who is similarly situated um, could share information about assistive technology and um, support and coverage and accessible housing and things that um, might not automatically come to mind if you are in the middle of a traumatic turn of life event. Um, next slide, please. Um, and regarding this mandatory consultation, let's talk about existing infrastructure. Um, some would push back on this by saying that Hospital ethics committees already exist. Um, if there is any doubt, why couldn't the hospital ethics committee engage in part of that consultation? And my response would be that hospital ethics committees are traditionally overwhelmingly comprised of um, physicians employed by the hospital, and there's a certain degree of collegiality there. So there isn't necessarily an outsider perspective and, or a disability perspective. 
for that matter, um, and we've also talked about how the medical model of looking at disability is likely embedded in the um, ethics committee's institution itself. Um, instead, I would suggest that the consultation um, maybe be done in partnership with centers for independent living, which are um, paid for by both the feds and state government, and they exist in communities um, to provide peer counseling, referral, and services in five different service areas, including um, transition and peer mentoring. So if um, a legislature was ever considering this kind of consultation, um, I would suggest that we do have some infrastructure that might be able to facilitate that kind of consultation. Next slide, please. And that is it for me. Thanks again for letting me present. If anyone has any questions, I'm happy to answer. Yep. So hang on just a second. We, because we have people that are broadcasting, we need to make sure we can hear the questions. So. Hi. Hello. So um, medical technology has progressed to the point where we can now treat acute injuries that people in the past would have otherwise die fr died from, and now they become disabled. If you impose a mandatory waiting period, do you think that that could have the negative effect that people that would have withdrawn treatment will now survive that acute injury and be become in the position where there's nothing they can do besides engage in physician aid and dying, which is arguably very a very different decision than withdrawing or withholding life support? I think it all depends on how any legislature imposing that kind of requirement would draft the statute. Um, I, I don't suggest a time frame. Um, since I am not a, a physician, I, I wouldn't purport to know what a reasonable period is, and that's why I suggested a couple of different ones. Um, but I, I do think that um, part of, again, we, we see overwhelmingly in studies that after about three weeks, people have changed their minds. And certainly, to address your question, everyone won't change their minds. Um, but the, the other effect is um, that I, I guess in state, I mean, cert, well, and then again, it depends if we're talking about physician-aided um, suicide, whether those people under the definition of terminal illness would qualify, like whether the statute would factor in the technology keeping them alive. Um, and then, I mean, I, I personally have always argued that if the individual, where there's a will, there's a way. Like if an individual goes through rehab, even if they're a quad, they're going to get a wheelchair, they can drive it into a wake if they want. Um, so I know that sounds horrible, um, but I, I think that if people are really hell-bent on not wanting treatment, there are ways that they will not have to live with the treatment indefinitely, if that makes sense. <laughs> We have another question, yes. Thank you so much for that talk. It really, um, you addressed a lot of concerns that I've certainly um, had to think about a lot. I really appreciate um, your, your approach to all of this. Um, I guess this is, I, I'm not quite sure how to phrase this question, so I guess I'll just say sort of what's um, challenging for me is, um, a couple of those cases, the, both the case at Grady and the case of Elizabeth Bouvier, were people who were in kind of a stable situation, and I think um, you sort of, make the case that there that um, there was a lot that could have been done that wasn't being done for them. So I think the thing I'm wrestling with is that on the one hand, society could have done a lot more to make their lives better. And in fact, in the case of um, McAfee, they, you know, he found a way. 
Um, but oftentimes nobody's doing it, you know, and so, you know, if the person says, well, this is my life, I mean, it, you know, I wish someone were here getting me out and taking me to, you know, and I wish I didn't have a professor who said horrible, sure. these horrible things, mm -hmm. but there they are kind of in this bad situation. And so I'm just struggling kind of as a clinician with how to respond to that. Right, right. Um, what can we do? Um, I think uh, part of the, the problem, I think, is, and, and I really am grateful that you had me here to address a group of the medical community from a disability perspective because I don't think there has been productive dialogue between the two groups nationally, historically. Um, I went to a bioethics conference once and literally um, bioethicists and disability advocates were snatching the microphones out of each other's hands and it was really ugly. Um, so I think that there is a place for um, disability advocates to do a better job getting into hospitals, maybe participating on advisory boards to the extent that they exist to provide a lot of those referral resources. Um, I work at Indiana Disability Rights which is a protection and advocacy agency. Um, they're federally funded and in every state. And our job is if someone calls us and they're not getting care, um, we have the, or, or the care that they are getting is abusive, we have the authority to go in there and initiate lawsuits to make changes. So that's kind of a lengthy process, and, but, and, and we don't want people to, you know, suffer while that's going on. But I think it's a start to get the ball rolling and to put people in touch. Um, the Centers for Independent Living have gone into nursing homes and literally taken people out and set them up in independent living environments. Um, so I think, and, and also, it, um, McAfee did well once he made connections to the disability rights community. Um, what I think is sad are the cases like um, Kenneth Bergstedt, which is a lot like the McAfee case, but uh, in disability community uh, advocates tried to reach out to him um, because he never got out of bed. He didn't really know what was available to him. Um, but he refused to speak on the phone with any, anyone because he didn't like the way, so said his father, that his voice sounded on the phone. So something that's hard for me is trying to brainstorm how do we reach out to those people um, who, who are inaccessible and let them know what the options are. Um, it, it reminds me of um, like Juliana Snow and Jericho Bolin were big cases this year. They were um, pediatric clients um, who had muscular dystrophy um, and decided that they wanted, um, Juliana was five and decided that she didn't want any more um, vigorous treatment. And then Jerrica had a BiPAP that she slept on at night. And she decided that she didn't want to wear the BiPAP anymore. Um, and you did see for the first time that I have been able to witness a, a huge social media campaign by the disability community um, not to publicize the issue but to reach out to those people and their families and try and be resources. So I don't know if that answers the question. But. Mm -hmm. Do we have other questions? 
Emily, we are grateful to you. Thank you. Will you be around a little bit if people have questions they would like to approach you individually about? Sure. All right. So let us thank. Right. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Right. Pardon my reach. 